Good afternoon. Welcome to the April 21st meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Thank you for joining us. We are going to begin today's council meeting with a recognition of Governor Jane Hall. Last week, the whole world joined with the Hall family in mourning the passing of Governor Jane D. Hall and her husband, Dr. Terry Hall. Amidst the crisis that we face, we know that losses are even more difficult. These were two individuals who, uh, who symbolized humble servant leadership. I can't begin to imagine how this loss is magnified amongst those closest to the halls. Jane Hall will be remembered as a force. Thanks to her, Arizona became the first state in the nation to have all five statewide elected officials statewide elected offices held by women. I know I speak for so many women leaders in our state when I say she helped forge the path on which we now walk. Dr. Hall, with an, an accomplished medical professional in his own right, was a trailblazer in more ways than one. He supported his wife's career at a time when it was not typical for women to work outside the home, let alone be elected to public office, and he did it all with great pride. They were a tremendous team, and Arizonans are richer for both their love and leadership. Regardless of the legacy these two individuals left, I know the pain of losing them both and so close together is something few can imagine. Terry and Jane Hall were true Arizona icons and their legacy will outlast us all. May the Hall family find solace in the love of one another during their time of grief. And now I will ask that we observe a moment of silence in honor of the passing of the Halls. Thank you all. The city of Phoenix joins the state of Arizona in flying flags at half mast to honor Governor Hall. Uh, we also know we have lost so many Americans since we last convened and Arizona faced our highest uh, single day loss of Arizonans to COVID-19. Uh, today we convene as part of our efforts to fight COVID-19 and I will turn it over to our assistant city manager Milton Dahoney to begin the updates of our fight against the virus. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. I'm here to give you an update on uh, several topics. We're gonna talk about the convention center warehousing uh, operation that we have going, public meetings, as was discussed previously by Alan Stevenson from Planning and Development. We're going to show you how we are adapting and conducting the police academy under the COVID-19 conditions. Uh, we will talk about a testing opportunity for first responders that has come to us by way of uh, Arizona State University. And then finally, we'll touch upon a reopening strategy uh, that uh, we want to share with you and let you know how we are approaching thinking about that. So first on the screen, you're seeing some space that we've made available in one of our convention center facilities. Uh, this is warehousing not just for supplies that we're getting in for the city of Phoenix, but it is an area that we're using for uh, supplies for the entire region. So we just made this operational within the past few days. Uh, we have space that was being unused and so it's uh, a service to the valley, but it also gives us an organized way uh, to receive the shipments that we're awaiting as well. A few weeks ago, Alan Stevenson was here to talk about uh, public meetings and trying to take them uh, into virtual uh, reality. Uh, the department worked with stakeholders out in the community in order to develop a process uh, for public hearings and public meetings. Uh, that process went live yesterday. Uh, it uses a WebEx software and first what we're going to do is show you a brief clip from the video that uh, the team made uh, the department working in concert with IT 
Uh, so we're going to show you that and then uh, be back to you in just a second. Hearing. You can choose to listen only or listen and watch the meeting take place. If you wish to listen to the meeting and not make a comment, phone in and put in the meeting number. Again, this is a listen option only. For the WebEx option, you can listen and watch and make comment. Applicants and the public must notify the assigned planner in advance to make comments. The planner will respond back with a link to the hearing or meeting. To log on to WebEx, click the link and follow the prompts. You will need to enter your name and email address. If you don't already have WebEx meetings, you will click add on. You can also log on from your iPhone or Android phone. Once you're in the meeting, you will be able to see those who are panelists or presenters. Assigned staff will control the meeting and assist when it's time for different presenters or the public to have their I think we had a few technical difficulties. I'm not sure how much uh, could actually be heard, but the video is available. It is at the bottom of all public meeting agendas. Uh, the key points uh, that they want to stress is if you want to participate in a virtual public meeting and you want to speak, the request is that you notify the staff 48 hours in advance so that you could be properly uh, keyed up in order to do that. Uh, as I indicated, uh, this process uh, started yesterday and the plan is to use it uh, for zoning adjustment hearings, for board of adjustment hearings, for planning commission meetings, for meetings of the Heritage Commission, for historic preservation uh, hearings, uh, for design review committee meetings, and they will be using this process uh, for the foreseeable future. Next, we want to pivot to the police academy. Under normal conditions, when we're doing the academy, we have a group of men and women that total somewhere around 50 people. Uh, usually, they are all located out at the academy, going through classes together, going through their various exercises together, uh, they're learning both the academic side of things and also the tactical side of what it takes to become a police officer. But within uh, the realm of COVID-19, we are not able to conduct the academy the way we normally would. So uh, we've had to adapt uh, our approach. The pictures that you see on the screen uh, show uh, men and women that are going through their own physical exercises either in their living room or out in their backyard. Uh, we are uh, piloting this remote learning opportunity. Uh, we're doing it in two-week intervals, so we do two weeks and then we assess and see what needs to be tweaked or changed, and then we go back uh, for another round. The distance learning is teaching uh, burglary reporting, uh, homicide investigation, and even after the return, uh, folks will be in, in smaller groups uh, teaching first aid and crime scene management. So it's certainly unique. Uh, I'm not sure how many other academies are being operated in this manner, but it is a way for us to keep a class together. If we didn't do this, we would have had to scrap the class and start over. This does give us an opportunity to keep the current class moving forward. Next, we want to pivot to talking about the possibility of testing first responders. We have had some discussions with the ASU uh, Biodesign uh, Department. Uh, they have made an offer to provide universal COVID-19 testing for first responders. Uh, that's the test that you see on television where the swab is used. Uh, it's inserted. Uh, up a nasal uh, cavity uh, to determine if, in fact, a person has the virus in them. Uh, the way that this is being discussed is that it would be a voluntary versus mandatory opportunity. 
and it would include asymptomatic people. So individuals that show no outward signs of symptoms of having COVID-19 uh, would still be tested. Uh, it, the testing would be done at the ASU laboratory in uh, Tempe. Uh, first responders would go and get the test done uh, during their off hours. And the offer from ASU does have the support of both chiefs and leadership of all three of the labor organizations. Additionally, this test would be done at no cost to the city. Uh, it was indicated during our discussions that the cost of the test is $100 each, but the philanthropic arm of ASU is willing to go out and seek funding in order to cover the cost. Uh, this testing of first responders is something that can begin as soon as all of the details are worked out. And to give a little insight as to uh, why ASU believes this is appropriate and something that should be done, they identify first responders as one of the most high-risk work populations within the community. And in addition to giving feedback to the men and women that are first responders, uh, they've indicated that by testing this population, we would be able to get some insights as to how far COVID-19 has penetrated Phoenix, Arizona. And so uh, because of that, uh, they're very high on beginning testing of both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. And just to give uh, some insight as to how it would happen, so a firefighter or an officer would go to the ASU lab, they would be tested, they would have to provide uh, some uh, identifying information about themselves, the test would be administered there, the results would come back uh, within 48 hours. Uh, all HIPAA and privacy considerations uh, would need to be addressed to make sure that the information is protected. Uh, there would need to be a signing of a waiver that would enable the city to be notified if an employee had tested positive. And then we would run through the protocol that we do now about uh, notifying people that that individual may have come in contact with. Uh, the testing that the ASU lab would be doing uh, would not be interrupting anything that's going on in a hospital or in a commercial uh, lab. Uh, this testing is FDA approved and ASU would be actually making the test themselves. So again, it's not taking away from testing that would be done in other parts of the community. Uh, there would need to be follow-up testing that would be done weekly and the litmus test, if you will, as to whether or when a person is ready to go back to work is you would need to have a negative test occur in two consecutive occurrences. So two consecutive negative tests means you're uh, free of COVID-19 and ready uh, to return to work. Uh, this opportunity, we believe, holds promise, and because there is so much interest, the labor leaders told us that a number of their members actually want to be tested. And so as soon as we can hammer out the details, it's something that we would like to move forward with. And then finally, uh, Thank you. opening. Uh, Milton, could we pause for a second before we go to reopening strategy? Sure, Mayor. Um, really want to thank you and the team at the city for working tirelessly on the testing issue. Good data is so important to keeping our employees safe as well as keeping our community safe. A huge thank you to Arizona State University for being our partners on this. They have invested in technology and as you mentioned, they've done it through philanthropy. So offering this to our first responders at, at no cost to the city is incredibly generous. This is a really important partnership between the City of Phoenix and Arizona State for all first responders who want to be tested, a great voluntary program. It's 
no small job that our police and firefighters do in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, and they have continued to do it without hesitation on the front lines. I hope that the testing partnership will help inadvertently prevent exposing, exposing our first responders and their loved ones to the virus so that because we'll have better sense of who has the virus and be able to address it. We've heard from healthcare professionals that testing is one of the most important things we can do to slow the spread of the virus. And we know that our first responders are among the highest risk in our community of being exposed to COVID-19 due to the work that they are doing. I also hope that this will give us a better sense of the spread of the virus throughout the city of Phoenix. I think we may talk about this later, but we need better testing and not all parts of our city have had high levels of testing, including some of our lower income communities have not yet seen adequate levels of testing. This data is not only important to keeping our first responders safe, but can also help us understand the status of COVID-19 in our community and move towards reopening something that we are all eager to do safely. It is my hope that Arizona State can continue working with our city and provide tests for all essential employees who continue working in this community. We're committed to the safety of every city employee and know that by providing tests to our frontline workers, we are taking steps towards safety. So again, I wanna thank ASU for this wonderful partnership for our chiefs, our city staff, our labor leaders for working on this. I think this is an important step forward. Thank you. Oh, thank Any you. additional council member comments on testing? All right, reopening strategy. Thank you, Mayor. So reopening is something that's being discussed around the country. Uh, it's being talked about at the state level, at the federal level, and at local levels. Uh, we're not sure exactly when the light will be green for reopening the economy, reopening society within Arizona or specifically within the city. But we do know that we can't wait until the light is green to start thinking about it. And so within our incident command structure, we have begun preliminary discussions with departments about reopening and what it might look like. Uh, we have established a 13-member work group to help manage the coordination uh, once uh, we get the direction to move forward. Uh, we have issued a set of reopening guidelines to help uh, influence the different facets that departments need to think about when they're making decisions or figuring out what reopening might look like. Uh, we view this as a process rather than a single event. Uh, we don't uh, view it as something where a switch will be hit and then the next day everything is exactly like it was before. Uh, probably that's not realistic, but that the process would unfold over a series of days or weeks or maybe even months, depending upon how things advance. Uh, the prioritized implementation would be triggered by council direction. So all we're doing is talking about it right now and talking about the different things that would need to be uh, included in a reopening uh, strategy, uh, the direction on when to move forward and how fast and what it might look like would uh, certainly uh, await the direction uh, from policymakers. And so some of the things that we are talking about and would need to address, uh, space redesign, for example. Uh, prior to COVID-19, if you would go into uh, virtually uh, any office within city government or department, uh, you might see a cluster of cubicles, a cluster of people working closer together. You may see a cluster of the public that's coming in uh, for various meetings or to engage with individual staff members. Uh, that design uh, needs to be uh, rethought uh, because even when the decision is made to reopen, we will still have to abide by social distancing guidelines and other things in order to keep people safe, especially since we don't yet have a vaccine. Uh, what does the reception area need to look like? How would people engage 
uh, citizens that are coming to visit city offices, uh, internal social interactions. A number of our departments uh, what might have uh, gatherings throughout the year for holiday observances and those kinds of things. Uh, what do those need to look like? How does food need to be handled in what will be our new reality? Uh, we have discovered a deeper capacity for teleworking than we knew originally. And so perhaps we want to extend the teleworking uh, beyond uh, the situation that we're in right now. So where is that feasible and where is it not? And so those are just a sample of a myriad of things that we would have to deal with uh, when we think about reopening. It's not on the slide, but uh, we will most likely need to maintain a higher level of cleaning. And so how do we do that? How is that factored into the budgets? So all of those are considerations that we're having. Uh, we wanted to come to you today and mention that we are beginning to think about it. Uh, so that we will be ready uh, to advance uh, once conditions uh, warrant it. And with that, I would be happy to try to answer any questions about anything that I've mentioned this afternoon. Thank you, Milton. Questions for our assistant city manager? Mayor? Councilman Nowakowski. So Mayor, out in the Levine area, we have about 20 cases so far. And we only have, there's not, there's not really a hospital south of the river. So is there a possibility to start looking into some type of a drive-through checking? Because there's nothing. When you talk about South Phoenix or south of the river or in the Levine area, that you can go to a hospital or you can go to one of these. Um, the only thing we have is that dignity health, right, out there. So um, is there any plans for the future to help out those areas that have a high level of of um, individuals with the virus. Uh, Mayor, members of council, Councilman Renokowski, there were a couple of spaces where your, your voice went out. I'm, are you asking about uh, the feasibility of creating an opportunity for testing, or are you asking about um, the receipt of medical services in those areas? A combination of both. Okay. Uh, that's certainly something uh, we can look into. The, um, it's, it's been mentioned in the news within the last week or so that uh, Walgreens is planning on setting up a drive-through testing uh, facility in different parts of the valley. It's not something that we would have the capacity to do, but it's something that we may be able to inquire about uh, with a partner uh, to make happen. It, it could not happen within the city realm, but uh, perhaps in the broader community realm as we talk with uh, both county folks and institutions outside the government. Uh, thank you, Milton. And Milton, just sort of for correction, um, there's about 60 south of the river that's confirmed so far. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Councilman, and thank you for your leadership in trying to make sure that, that everyone has access to testing. Uh, I did reach out to Walgreens when they announced their El Mirage location and encouraged them to have a location in Phoenix, particularly one on our transit system. Uh, the current location in El Mirage is not served by the bus system or paratransit. Um, they are offering free testing paid by Health and Human Services. Um, which I think is important and needed in this community, but we need to make sure you can access it if you do not have a car. And so that's something that I think it continues to be important. I've asked um, that to be placed on Valley Metro's agenda to try to increase access to the existing testing facilities, but it continues to be a challenge. And if you look at the data and zip codes where testing has occurred, it is not yet covering every community that needs it. Uh, Councilwoman Stark. Okay. I'm sorry, did I hear? I'm sorry, it was uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Mayor. I'm sorry, yeah, my, I, I my, my voice recognition is lacking. No, it wasn't. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes, yeah, so um, 
so I know there's just been different council members. I think we've all had different questions on how we can use the coronavirus re relief funds. Can we use it for different things? Um, so, because, so, so with that, um, I would like to suggest, and I know that there are council members interested into signing onto a letter to the Treasury's Department to encourage the ability to use coronavirus relief funds to replace reduced and lost city revenue. So I just wanted to put that on the record that it's, it's a letter that, we're in, that we've put together and we're gonna be sending it out. And any council member that would like to sign on to it, um, we'd be more than happy to have them on the letter. Wonderful, thank you. That is so important to our city right now. And as I understand it, the draft legislation in the US Senate passed did not include re additional revenue for cities nor the ability to use, use COVID funds for revenue replacement. And as you have so elegantly put it, that is still a, a significant challenge for us. Right, and then I did have a question for, for Milton. On, on, one of the, on one of the bullet points, I, I wanted to know, how is it that we would choose um, those 13 people that would sit on, on this committee? How would that get chosen? Um, what areas would we be looking um, to be represented in, in this committee or in this group of people? So Mayor, members of council, Vice Mayor Guardado, um, each time that I have come to give updates on uh, various aspects of our COVID-19 response, you have heard me make reference to our incident command structure. So that is a group of between 50 and 60 city employees that uh, I convene by way of WebEx three times a week. So the 13 people are all uh, employees and members uh, from that group. So uh, Public Works, for example, that has responsibility for a lot of facilities uh, is represented there. Uh, all of the deputy city managers are represented there. And so what we are asking uh, departments to do is to give thought to the different aspects of reopening and to uh, work with their uh, either deputy city manager or assistant city manager on what their ideas are. Uh, and then uh, we would be bringing uh, that back to, I'm assuming, one of these kinds of meetings. Uh, so the 13, the 13 people are, are staff level people that come from the departments uh, that would actually be uh, needing to devise strategies uh, when the decision is made to reopen. I'm sorry, sorry. I can't, can't hear you. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, we, I was on mute. Um, I, I guess because one of the things, because um, I know that, that this is going to be a longer conversation and you know we're going to go back and forth about this, because um, I, would, I would like for us to, to work on some sort of advisory committee um, that would, you know, that would probably like include um, some doctors, um, you know, di different, you know, different experts that are going to be impacted um, as we decide to open up um, and trying to get advice from them and having them lead us on how is it that we should go back to reopening um, the city. Like, I, I, I mean, that's, that's what I was envisioning that, that we would do, that we would get advice um, from, from different folks and getting input on how we should actually um, make this happen. I think we've done a lot of work as a city um, to, to keep our constituents safe and to figure out the best strategy. And we're taking a huge hit in the economy because of this. And as we decide to reopen, I just think that we just need to like be led um, by experts and people that can be with us as we make these tough decisions. That's just food for thought. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, members of council, Vice Mayor Guardado. The, uh, 
the kind of advice that you are referring to that would uh, inform the policy level decision about when to reopen and what that might look like and considerations that would need to be had uh, certainly makes perfect sense. Um, we certainly would not, we're not proposing that the group that I refer to would be advising on those kinds of things, but uh, if you have an interest in setting up a group like that and would want us to help with that, uh, council directs us to do that, we're certainly amenable to doing that. Mayor? Yeah, that, that would, I'm sorry, just one last comment. Um, yes, that would be great, because I think we gotta like talk to different entities, we gotta bring in experts, we gotta bring in some doctors, professionals, um, we gotta bring in labor, different people, um, so that we can figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Councilman Nowakowski. Mayor, I think the Vice Mayor is onto something great, is that we should create a task force, maybe, how to, bring things back to normal. Maybe we can have um, individuals from different um, council districts participate. Because I know that um, we have a lot of restaurants, nightclubs, we have in the entertainment business. They're all gonna wanna start going out and, and just partying, right? So how do we do that in a nice way, right? And at the same time, um, also, I just really wanna thank um, um, Chris Mackey and her individuals in the IDA for everything they're doing. Um, that m the money is already um, committed for for all the money that they raised. And if there's any way that we can actually put some more money into that grant, the um, small business. Um, I know that first is when they're looking to start to distribute that um, that funds. Um, so if there's any way to help support that, I know that there's a lot of small businesses that are not continue knocking on our doors that weren't able to apply for that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski. Councilman Mayor. DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. You know, and I like the idea of having a task force. The problem is we just don't have that kind of time left in this economy. People are already starting to lose their homes. They're not going to have jobs to go back to. Every day that goes by that this economy is closed is every day that somebody's going to lose a job. We're talking about saving lives. If we don't open this economy, we're not gonna be able to save lives. People are gonna lose their lives. They're gonna lose their jobs. They're going to lose the American dream that they've worked hard for. So from my end, we need to start looking at models that open it up sooner. One of the ideas that I've gotten, I've had from others, that I've received from others, is opening up the entire economy, May 1, responsibly, practicing social distancing, taking the next 30 days to monitor that to see how it works, and then readjust and then look at June 1 as a complete reopening date. There's no reason right now for us to be closing down. We've got people losing their jobs. They're not going to have jobs to go back to. Right now, everybody's getting something out of this economy right now except for those hardworking individuals in our community. We need to find a way that opens this economy as soon as possible, done in a responsible way, and that means May 1st and with practicing social distancing within the business community and individuals that work there, keeping them safe, and then opening up June 1 if everything goes well. We need to move faster. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Stark? Was oh. that, who was, um, who asked to speak? I'm sorry, it was, there was someone who spoke after Councilman DeCicio? It wasn't me. It was Councilwoman I, Pastor. Excellent, Councilwoman Pastor. I, I'm, I'm going to learn that to recognize your voice with with the safety equipment on. I apologize for that. So Councilwoman yeah. Pastor, you have the floor. I was just. I just think we need to be cautious. Nobody's disagreeing that we shouldn't open open up the economy, but it's how do we open up the economy, and how do we go about uh, the social distance piece, and what are the best procedures of doing that. Uh, we have to be mindful, uh, just open up the economy and uh, not really putting in some procedures and practices uh, is only going to make us go back in and hit harder. Uh, nobody's arguing about not opening up the economy, it's being responsible in how we go about doing it. 
Well said, Councilwoman Pastor. Any additional comments or questions? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you to Milton. Uh, I would next turn to the Vice Mayor for a motion on executive session. Yes, Mayor, in accordance with a property posted notice and agenda, I move that the City Council pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute Section 38 through 431.038 meet in executive session on Thursday, April 23rd, 2020 at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room 12th floor of Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street, Phoenix, Arizona. Additional, I move to change the start time of the Thursday, April 23rd, 2020 policy session from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Passes unanimously. We will have an executive session in, in two days as well as uh, continue with our formal updates or our policy session related to COVID. Uh, thank you, Milton. We will next turn to the city's uh, strategy around social services and homelessness. This is an item that is important to all of our city council. Before COVID-19 dominated daily lives, we agreed unanimously to pursue an aggressive strategy to fight homelessness. We know that as Phoenix has grown and become the fastest growing city in the United States that so many have been left behind and that we have a, a growing and very serious problem with people experiencing like homelessness. We spend annually $20 million on housing and homelessness, but still more resources and we need more resources and more partners to fight this battle. Phoenix has been shouldering the ver ver burden of sheltering residents for much of the county and there is still a severe shortage of beds and resources for these individuals. Uh, before our new reality hit, the governor had agreed to work with Phoenix on putting together a regional meeting of elected officials and stakeholders to look at a collaborative process. Unfortunately, over the last six weeks, our reality has drastically changed. We now face a budget shortfall like almost every other city in the nation and the population that was so vulnerable before our unsheltered is in an even more precarious position with the spread of COVID-19 hanging over us all, at all. Our city staff have been working diligently the last few weeks to identify resources available to provide us with immediate relief to people experiencing homelessness, those living in the city's public housing and others facing precarious living situations. Before we look at what resources we have, I wanna thank the partners who have been working behind the scenes to help residents experiencing homelessness. Circle the City has been doing such important work and trying to prepare for any potential spread of COVID-19 in the experience uh, in, and any need for isolation units at our Human Service Campus. Our providers at the Human Service Campus have also been working to add additional safety measures and help those who are most vulnerable including seniors and people with compromised immune systems. So to the Human Services Campus, to CAS, to UMOM, to Native American Connections, St. Vincent de Paul, Sonoran Prevention Works, Southwest Recovery Alliance, and so many others, thank you for the work you have been doing to provide care in these very difficult times. We are grateful for your staff, for their strategic thinking, and also for their selflessness in, in providing this care and assistance. Uh, our whole city council sees your work and, and values it, and we wanna thank you. Also wanna thank Maricopa County for stepping up and providing resources, particularly for those who are most vulnerable or who have the virus. Uh, we are glad to have partners. Homelessness is not a problem for any one branch of government. We need to do more at the city. We need to do more at the state. We need to more, do more at the federal government, but today we, we have a chance to take a, an important first step Today could represent our largest increase in homelessness funding in any single vote. So I want to thank everyone who's worked to get us to this important vote and introduce our assistant city manager to present. Deanna, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. We're here today to present the Housing and Urban Development CARE Act funding the City of Phoenix is receiving and our proposed homelessness response plan. Joining me today is Cindy Stotler, our Housing Director, Spencer Self, Neighborhood Services Director, and Marshall Franklin, our Human Services Director. I want to first talk about the five allocations that we're going to be receiving from HUD. The first one is our Emergency Solutions Grant in the amount of $4.9 million. We'll also be receiving Community Development Block Grant funding in the amount of $9.8 million. Also, our Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, or HOPWA, a little over $440,000. In addition, we'll be receiving 10.3 million of Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program dollars, and finally, 1.2 million of public housing. So in total, we'll be receiving a little under $27 million. I want to first discuss the two allocations of money that we're proposing to use to implement our COVID-19 homelessness plan. As you recall, a few months ago, Council directed staff to develop a homelessness, homelessness plan and present the plan in June. However, as a result of the COVID-19, we are before you today to discuss how we can begin to address this issue during the crisis, keeping in mind that both pots of money are one-time allocations that will help us create long-term lasting solutions. And the total amount, again, for our homelessness plan is $8.9 million. To provide just a little bit of background on where we are in homelessness, the most recent point in time count that was conducted this past January showed an 18% increase in the number of homeless unsheltered individuals in the city of Phoenix. This is about 2,300 individuals. As the mayor indicated a moment ago, we are currently investing over 20 million annually into our program to provide services such as outreach and engagement, move in deposits, housing stabilization, and support services. Before I talk about our plan, and again, the mayor alluded to this a little bit ago, I wanted to just speak to some of the efforts that are occurring already. Maricopa County is proposing and opening their county lots uh, around the CAS campus to start appropriately distancing individuals. This will begin tomorrow. They have also secured temporary locations for vulnerable populations, and they are in the process of securing temporary hotels for individuals that are confirmed positive cases. Also, Circle the City has um, located two tents behind their permanent location. This is providing 48 additional beds for individuals under investigation. They are also creating in their uh, permanent location 10 beds for individuals that are confirmed positive. If, in fact, they exceed the 10 beds, they can open up an additional 40 beds. Along with these two efforts, United Way and the business community is also very supportive of our homeless efforts and how they can be helpful in those efforts. We really wanted to take a look at collectively, and when I say collectively, I'm referring to both our city internal departments as well as the many partners that we've worked with for many years in our community, and look at each of the populations we would serve and how we can identify the best interventions that would meet the long-term needs of the population with the ultimate goal of achieving housing and stability. So again, with this one-time funding, we want to create a plan that has lasting effects beyond the COVID-19 crisis. The first area we looked at was vulnerable and at-risk individuals, and these are people we're referring to over the age of 60 or with underlying health conditions. We also wanted to take a look at uh, families and uh, single women, our single men, and our youth. When we talk about interventions, as I said before, each of these populations, and even within the populations, are at different places in their lives when we're talking about homelessness. So we wanted to create a multi-pronged approach to make sure that we have interventions that are available for each of the populations and depending on where they are. So we are looking at some emergency shelter interventions. We're also looking at rapid rehousing, which really helps people get housed much more quickly, and then providing rental assistance over an on average nine month period, along with some count case management services to make sure they remain stabilized in the housing. We wanted to look at, in partnership with the housing department, some of our section eight vouchers for the permanent supportive housing piece, 
as well as our VASH vouchers that are within the housing department, those, those individuals that we identify as veterans that we can work with our uh, local VA. So to talk specifically about the different populations interventions, when we look at our vulnerable and at risk, what we are proposing is identifying a, a hotel that we could serve 100 individuals. And again, the CDC guidelines recommend that you identify a hotel with outward facing rooms um, to keep them distance appropriately. So we would be looking at a 100 room hotel. We would be looking at a provider providing those services in the hotel for us because it will require 24 seven services. We'll need to consider the security, the laundry services, the wraparound case management, as well as meals each and every day. As I indicated previously, because we want it to be long-lasting solutions while they're in this temporary shelter, we also want to provide rapid rehousing to approximately 60 of the individuals. This is what we consider uh, rental assistance for the individuals over a nine-month period. In this particular intervention, we would be including and leveraging our lie heap so that they would get move-in, uh, deposits and utility deposits as well as rental and utility assistance. Again, one of the key things to keep them housed is providing the case management services during that nine month period to make sure they're securing the appropriate employment and receiving the services they need to stay to be successful in housing. We are also looking at another intervention, as I said, in providing uh, permanent, permanent su uh, supportive housing vouchers, or these are our, what we refer to as our Section 8 vouchers. Right now, we have approximately 40 identified in this intervention. Council made the decision a few years back to prioritize our Section 8 vouchers, and they prioritized 275 of those vouchers. We have about 50 remaining. I will tell you in this intervention, we are estimating 40, but what we may find with this population is that we will utilize less rapid rehousing and need more permanent supportive housing. So we may be coming back to council at a later time to see if we can pr uh, prioritize additional Section 8 vouchers. And these are estimated costs for these interventions. We're estimating about 3.5 million for this particular population and intervention. The next one we're looking at is our families. Um, as you know, United Methodist Outreach Ministries, or UMOM, is our largest family provider in the city of Phoenix. And we are looking to expand their beds over the short term during the COVID crisis to an additional 25 beds. That would turn over in a year's time about uh, four times. So we'd be looking at serving at a minimum 100 families. We would also be proposing to provide to them as well uh, rapid rehousing dollars to serve an additional 100 families in that particular intervention. In addition, again, we would leverage our LIHEAP, uh, our Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program that's in the Human Services Department now to provide uh, utility deposits and bill assistance. And we are estimating about 2.1 million for that proposed intervention. On the single women's side, we are proposing four different uh, interventions. We are looking at, again, rapid rehousing. Um, Central Arizona Shelter Services, or CAS, is our uh, single largest, our largest provider for our single women and men. And so they would be working in partnership with UMOM. UMOM does have the Howley Center that houses women currently, as well as those that are within our uh, CAS shelter. And so we would be looking at 200, serving 200 women on the rapid rehousing side um, in that particular intervention. Again, the nine months on average worth of rental assistance along with the utility assistance. We would also be looking at allocating 10 VASH vouchers. There is less women on the um, by name list that are veterans, but again, if we find there's additional beyond the 10, we could certainly identify more VASH vouchers. And uh, we would be looking at 10 there we're also looking at allocating five of our Section 8 vouchers of the 50. As I said before, we're allocating 40 to the vulnerable. This would be five on the women's side. And that would be approximately $1.8 million. For the single men, we are proposing very similar to the women, serving 200 men in rapid rehousing. We would be looking at leveraging, again, our, our low-income home energy assistance program. 
because there are more men on the by name list, uh, as far as our VASH vouchers, we would be allocating 40. If, in fact, we find that there are additional that could use the VASH vouchers, we would continue to work in partnership with housing to identify more. And then finally, we would look at five additional Section 8 vouchers on the um, intervention for the single men, and that would be approximately $1.8 million. And speaking with our uh, youth providers, one of the main things they were requesting is additional case management services and janitorial services. This is so they could have somebody housed uh, potentially down at our cash shelter to either divert youth from coming into the shelter and getting them appropriately um, referred to youth services and or getting them out, out of, the, of the cash shelter much more quickly. In addition, they were requesting janitorial services due to the increased needs they have during the COVID-19. So that would be approximately $80,000. To summarize what we are proposing, we're proposing to serve 200 additional families, 210 women, 245 men, and then 100 individuals uh, that we are referring to as our vulnerable populations, along with the additional funding on the youth side. This would serve approximately 200 families and 555 individuals. That uh, proposal would utilize our 8.9 million of CDBG. The total cost is 9.4 million. The gap we are hoping to utilize if and when we receive additional emergency shelter grant funding, we are supposed to hear in the next 30 to 60 days on that, as well as the COVID-19 funding that is coming directly to the city. I will tell you um, through our homeless management information system, when you look at the number of people on the by name list by population, within the city of Phoenix, it's about 1,823 people, and we're proposing to serve 755, which would be about 40%. And with that, I will turn it over to Cindy to walk through the housing dollars. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. As Deanna mentioned earlier, the CARES Act provided approximately $12 million in additional funding for three Housing Department Formula Grant programs. The Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, or HOPLA program, the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher program, Sorry, I couldn't see the screen, sorry. Uh, and the public housing program. I will provide details for each program on the following slides. So we've been allocated a total of $440,505 in additional HOPLA funds. The HOPLA program provides rental assistance, eviction prevention, workforce development, and casework services for about 1,000 clients per year. The additional CARES Act funding can be used for rental assistance, supportive services, and other necessary actions to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19 epidemic. In order to get this funding out quickly and assist those in needs right now, we propose, our housing proposes to ex use existing contracts to provide $340,505 in rental assistance. This will provide 40 new clients with rental assistance for one year, and $100,000 in eviction prevention providing short-term rent, mortgage, and utility assistance to keep clients in their current housing. This will assist about 100 new clients. So this funding is estimated to serve 138 new HOPLA clients and their families. The CARES Act allocates approximately 1.25 million for public housing operating costs. Phoenix Housing manages over 2,100 public housing units with about 5,500 residents. Public housing operating costs are funded with a combination of rent paid by our tenants and an operating subsidy from HUD. The additional funding in the CARES Act will support public housing operations and maintenance by compensating for an anticipated rental revenue loss. Public housing residents pay 30% of their income in rent. When their income is reduced to job in or I'm sorry, when their income is reduced due to job loss or reduced hours, their rent is adjusted down so they continue to pay no more than 30% of their current income towards rent. We anticipate a significant reduction in rental revenue due to COVID-19 job losses. In addition to compensating for reduced rental income, the funding is intended to pay for additional PPE, 
cleaning supplies, biohazard cleanups, and any other costs associated with the COVID-19 response for public housing residents. The estimated 1.25 million in additional housing, I'm sorry, I'm there. The estimated 1.25 million in additional funding is roughly equal to two months of regular operating subsidy from HUD, and it should be available to us in early May. The last, the CARES Act also allocates an estimated 10.3 million for the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Phoenix Housing currently manages over 6,800 Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers. The Section 8 program is funded with two separate allocations from HUD, one for our administrative costs and the other for housing assistance payments for rental subsidy. The CARES Act is providing an estimated $700,000 in additional funding for administrative costs to fund PPE, supplies, equipment, IT programming, extra cleaning, and other costs associated with the COVID-19 response. Through the CARES Act, HUD is also setting aside an additional $9.6 million in housing assistance payments to compensate for income losses by housing choice voucher holders. Like public housing, voucher holders' rents are calculated at 30% of their income, and the Section 8 program subsidizes the rest of the monthly rent amount. When the voucher holders lose their jobs or have their hours reduced, their rental payment is reduced to 30% of their current income, and the Section 8 program will pay a larger monthly rental subsidy. So just to be clear, this doesn't fund any additional vouchers. It just provides more subsidy as needed for existing vouchers. The estimated total additional funding for Section 8 is $10.3 million, and it's based on about two months of current allocations and will be made available in early May. That concludes the presentation on Housing Department funding. I will turn it back to Deanna, or Spencer. I'm sorry, we turn it to Spencer. Thank you, Cindy. The Community Development Block Grant COVID funds are intended to be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. HUD is still rolling out guidelines, so we don't have perfect clarity into what the funds can or cannot be used for. However, we do know we cannot use the funds to provide the same benefit that other funding sources might provide if another source of financial assistance is available to pay that cost. For example, FEMA, the Small Business Administration, or the Emergency Solutions Grant, uh, which Deanna mentioned earlier. The funds must be expended by September 22nd, or September 2022, which is reasonable given their intended use, and we hope to get the funds expended much quicker to ensure a swift COVID response. We know certain regulatory standards will not be waived, including some, such as environmental regulations, uh, which can add a significant amount of time to the length of a project, including large public facility acquisition, construction, or rehabilitation projects. We also know we may request waivers for other standards. However, HUD has not provided guidance as to which other standards or how those requests will be evaluated. Finally, we know we must include the funding in our annual action plan and consolidated plan, which I will expand on more in a few slides. In total, we are receiving, as Deanna mentioned, 9.8 million of CDBG COVID funds. As previously mentioned, more than 40% or $4 million of these funds will, will be dedicated to serving the homeless population to prevent the potential spread of COVID-19. The 5.8 million of, of remaining funds are proposed to be used in the following ways based on the needs we are seeing in the community. $2 million for very small businesses, $2 million for nonprofit organizations, $1 million for low and moderate income residents to allow them to shelter in place, uh, which we're planning to and, uh, pair an additional $1 million in previous CDBG funds if we can move quickly enough on this category for a total of $2 million. And then finally, $800,000 for planning, capacity building, and technical assistance. And I'll go over each one of these categories on the next few slides. Recognizing the overwhelming needs of the small business community, uh, including noting how quickly the initial Small Business Administration funding dried up, we believe there would be an incredible benefit to providing $2 million in lifelines to established microenterprises, those are businesses with five or, few em or fewer employees, to provide for lost revenue, to provide services or goods related to COVID-19, 
or to provide their goods or services in a new way. For example, a small family-owned restaurant that can no longer provide a dine-in option may need funds to change their website to allow online ordering or acquire a vehicle to provide delivery service. The idea would be to partner with a nonprofit to provide a streamlined application process to allow less sophisticated businesses who may not have the ability to access other funding options access to emergency funding. Uh, for example, they may not have an existing established relationship with a lending institution or an accountant to provide detailed financial answers or documentation. Other lending programs may not be the best option for them. At up to $10,000 per grant, at least 200 businesses we anticipate serving with these funds. We further propose dedicating $2 million to provide grants and or loans for nonprofits to provide, again, goods or services related to COVID-19. For example, if there's a gap in funding to provide food boxes for specific low and moderate income neighborhoods who previously had access to other uh, sources of nutrition that are no longer available, or to provide for existing community needs in a new way. So a nonprofit that might traditionally provide services at their facility may need to change their service delivery model to allow their customers to shelter in place or ensure appropriate social distancing. Also, we're proposing uh, using a modified version of an existing established process we typically use for our public service and public facility RFP, including using the Community Development Review Committee to allocate those grants. At up to uh, $50,000 each, this would provide 40 or more nonprofits with funding uh, to provide for the needs of our community. Finally, we cannot expect our residents to remain at home if their home does not have the key features needed to provide for their comfort and safety. With a community adjusting to the new reality of needing to responsibly shelter in place, we are proposing $1 million in funding to partner with a nonprofit to provide home rehab services for low and moderate income resident, uh, residential properties that have a need for critical system repair, such as air conditioning as we quickly reach 90 degree days, plumbing for those without running water for kitchens or restrooms, and possibly even roof patching if these funds last through the monsoon season. At an estimated $10,000 per household, this would help approximately 100 households. Now this work is anticipated to take much more time than the other categories. However, if we are successful in quickly dispensing these funds, and there continues to be a need for sheltering in place, we would propose adding an additional $1 million in available CDBG funds from prior years to support this area at the same level as the nonprofit and microenterprise categories. We're also requesting to keep $800,000 uh, set aside for administrative needs to gather data and develop nonprofit-specific emergency infectious disease response plans. Uh, one, one example of how we, uh, that we're exploring is the possibility of using these funds to provide an enhanced tool with HMIS data to provide information regarding availability of beds for homeless residents to offer immediate services in the field. We usually allocate 20% of our CDBG funds for administrative use. However, with our current infrastructure in place from our traditional allocations, we do not anticipate the need for that much additional funding. If approved, there are a series of next steps we'll need to take. Uh, one, we'll need to request any necessary waivers from HUD. As I mentioned, the Federal Register notice has not been provided at this point, uh, but we are developing a list of anticipated waivers that we may need to submit. Additionally, we'll need to amend our citizen participation plan to include an expedited public comment period and virtual public hearing which we're planning to bring to the May 6th Council Formal Meeting. And we need to substantially amend the 2019 Annual Action Plan and complete the 2020 to 2025 Consolidated Plan for the CDBG, ESG, Home, and HOPWA funds, many of which were already mentioned. And we anticipate uh, bringing that to the May 20 Council Formal Meeting. Now, all of this is contingent on your general approval of this plan today and additional guidance we may receive from HUD. So, Mayor, we are seeking two separate approvals today. The first approval is to seek council approval for a COVID-19 homelessness plan utilizing the following fund sources, our $4.9 million in emergency solutions and our $4 million in community development block grant. 
The second recommendation for approval is to seek council authorization to approve the remaining COVID-19 funding and uses as presented, the $5.8 million in community development block grant, and the $11.9 million in housing and urban development funds. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you for your hard work on this and for including so many uh, specific populations and, and, and partners. Uh, Councilwoman Stark leads our committee that, that uh, works on many of the issues around homelessness, and we will turn to her first. Thank you, Mayor. And first and foremost, I want to thank staff for all their hard work. They've done a tremendous amount of work in a short amount of time. And of course, I want to thank our many partners like you, Mom, Circle of the City, CAS, and Maricopa County. And to that end, Deanne, I have a question about what Maricopa County is doing. First, I know they're opening up three lots. And so is the priority going to be the people in the easements, the people living in the easements? Will they be the first to be offered a place in one of these um, lots? And then second and third, I guess, are, are they going to have water facilities and restroom facilities? And then after everyone is situated, are we then as a city going to go in and do a deep cleaning of the, of the streets, the easements, and the sidewalks? Mayor, Council, Councilwoman Stark, yes, so it's my understanding the county's going to begin with, I believe they've identified approximately 38 individuals that they have identified as vulnerable. Those are the first ones they'll be moving on to the lot. As they begin to move people, I believe it's my understanding they'll be able to serve about 150 in the two county lots. They will have hand washing stations as well as bathroom facilities on those lots. Thank you. And then we're going to follow with a deep cleaning. I'm sorry. Yes. So what our intended plan is we currently are doing regular cleaning on Wednesdays. The process that we talk through with the departments and the staff is as we get individuals appropriately spaced on the lots, once that's been completed, we would go through and do a deep cleaning in that area. And just one more follow up. So the, the people that are vulnerable, are they still trying to focus on the people that are living in the easement? Vulnerable population in the easement areas? I know that's been a big concern for the, the uh, surrounding businesses and residents. Yes, we are referring to those that are out on the streets. The uh, intervention that we're talking about uh, the 100 room hotel as a shelter, we're talking about moving some individuals out of CAS. If we're able to move those individuals out of CAS and there are still individuals in the surrounding area that are considered vulnerable, we would also look at moving those. But the intent of the county, and I should say the one location that the county identified, the, I believe it's 50, approximately 50 rooms, I'm looking at Marshall, that's going to also be utilized for vulnerable populations. So they're going to move 50 vulnerable individuals to that location, and then they're going to start moving additional vulnerable individuals to the lots. And then we're also looking at moving vulnerable individuals to the location we uh, are proposing to secure. OK, well, I, I really commend the county for stepping up to help us. I do appreciate it. Um, and a special thanks to you, Deanna. I know you have done a lot of work on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank Mayor. you, Councilwoman. Ca Councilmember Garcia. Yeah. Oh. OK. Well, go. all right, I'm going to go. Um, so one, first, I want to outline or, or I guess bring up the, the, the fact that we still, we don't have public health um, person inside our staff. I think it's going to, it would be important if we could, con if we could try to find someone that could come onto our staff that has a public health uh, view and frame to advise us on some of these issues. Um, the, the cleanups were brought up, the sweeps were brought up. I think we, as of last week, I, I was there at last week. I, I do think there's a lot more things that we need to be sensitive to. There were some enforcement issues in the last two weeks that I think we've addressed. Um, but I think we need to be careful during the pandemic to be shifting people around. The CDC has recommended to leave people in place. So I think we need to focus and figure out 
uh, best practices to do that. And if we don't have the ability to do that in-house, bring someone in um, that could give us that framing. And so I'm just asking for more sensitivity when it comes to the cleanups or the sweeps um, that we're doing. Um, I had a question for Deanna about the vulnerable population. I saw in the PowerPoint that the, the only folks that are described on there are, is the senior population. I'm wondering if, if there or somewhere else we can include other vulnerable populations such as undocumented folks, uh, domestic violence survivors, LGBTQ, and other uh, vulnerable populations that may need support. Um, I know last time the chief came um, before us, she stated that there, the domestic violence calls were up, and so just keeping an eye on that. Um, a question for Cindy as well around the Section 8 uh, vouchers. Are these additional vouchers that we're putting in, or is it part of what was already allotted before? So, so, Councilman, this is Deanna. Um, we certainly can take a look at, uh, and I should clarify, I didn't before, but Circle the City and CBI are doing assessments of those individuals outside of the campus as well uh, to help us identify vulnerable populations as you're speaking to. And we certainly can work with our DV providers to see how we can also partner with them as we identify, like you said, these other populations. On the vulnerable side, um, in addition to the people over 60, we're also looking at people with underlying health conditions. They may not be over 60, but they are considered during the COVID-19 crisis as vulnerable, so it would be those two. I do want to clarify, while we're identifying a 100-room location, that's the minimum number of people we would be serving. We are anticipating, as we bring on a provider to provide services at that location, as they start working with people and as people exit either to rapid rehousing or as we spoke about to Cindy's uh, Section 8 vouchers, we will continue to bring more people into the location. So our intent is to start with 100, but as people are exiting, we will continue to bring more people into that location. So at minimum, we'd be serving 100. Thank you. Any additional questions, Councilmember Garcia? I, I can also speak to, because I know you asked about the housing choice voucher, so I'll let Cindy speak to that. Thank you, Mayor and Councilmember Garcia. Regarding the vouchers that Deanna included in her homeless uh, conversation, the VASH vouchers are already, in, are already part of our 903 VASH voucher allocation. We only have about 709 leased up today, so we have plenty of vouchers to use for the homeless that we find um, as we go through this process. And then on the other side with the permanent supportive housing vouchers, we have a 275 voucher set aside that the council approved about five years ago to house the chronically homeless um, in partnership with the Human Services Department providing casework and referrals. Um, we have leased up about 220 of those 275, so we have 50 available at this time, and that's what we put towards the homeless uh, process that we're working on right now. And Councilman Garcia, on the last point that you made about the health expert, we can certainly look at our COVID-19 funding uh, to see, to your point, as we're moving forward with this location and moving people within and outside of the campus, bringing on somebody to work specifically with us through those efforts. If the the council, if the one more chooses. point. Yeah, just one more point on, I, I think if, if that's what we need to do, and, and I know it's difficult to try to find a location, but I, I would like to look at alternatives to the hotel, um, something that could stay beyond this period, something that can, uh, that we can continue to use past this. And, and I think investing or using the, the funding that's gonna support people long-term um, would be great. And I, and I know we've tried, you've looked at different options, but um, maybe, doing a lesser uh, term on the, on the hotel instead of doing the whole year, maybe doing a six month chunk and then looking at if we can at the same time develop um, other properties that we can have long term for folks. Councilman Garcia, certainly if the council chooses to go a shorter time frame on the hotel, 
we can see what remaining CDBG funds are available. Are you, I believe you're referring to identifying locations that we could potentially, I'm leaping out here, acquire for permanent housing solutions? That's are right, you, or the thought of the, the mini homes or building out other spaces or recreating other spaces, yes. Yes, I should tell you, in addition to everything we're talking about today, the team is also looking at other locations and opportunities, not only with the COVID-19 monies, but also, Spencer can speak a, a minute to, additional CDBG funding that we could potentially look at in acquiring properties in partnership with Cindy to create some more affordable housing opportunities. Thank, Thank you, you, Deanna. Yes. Uh, we have been working very closely with Cindy and the housing department, as well as Marshall in, with the human services department, to look at what options there may be to acquire either within the city or with one of our nonprofit partners to increase the number of affordable housing units uh, the city has to offer or uh, providing additional shelter or whatever the need may be. Uh, we have prior uh, CDBG funds as well, so we don't have to look to this COVID pot in and of itself. Um, we may be able to be flexible to meet multiple needs. And this is Deanna again. As Spencer has indicated, we will be coming back with additional information on the affordable housing side, as well as you had asked us to come back in June with a full plan, and those are the types of things that we would be considering and looking at in our larger plan outside of the COVID-19 recommendations. Mayor? This is Councilman Lewkowski. Uh, Councilman, uh, and just, I guess, b before we move on to that, I wanted to react to something Councilmember Garcia said. Um, I certainly would be supportive of, of solutions that can continue longer term. And since we do have additional money uh, in traditional community development block grants for some of the programs we would now call uh, shelter in place, I would be supportive of, of allocating that million dollars towards um, some sort of affordable housing that could continue with a different funding source after COVID-19, but that could get in place. But I, I would have a preference for solutions that are available right away as opposed to something that we would build because summer is upon us and we need to get people into housing as soon as possible, both because of COVID-19 and heat and just general enormous need in our community. So appreciate Councilmember Garcia's suggestion in that area. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski, floor is yours. Thank you, Mary, and I agree with you 100%. We should look for long-term solutions if possible. Um, you know, I just really want to thank Deanna and her team, uh, you know, Cindy, uh, Marshall, and Spencer for all your hard work in coming up with a long-term solution and also a short-term solution for this problem. One of the things that I want to make sure um, with Spencer's uh, um, funding that we have for the small businesses that we make sure we target the small mom and pop businesses, especially in those hard hit areas. And also if the individuals have received funding from the federal level or any other CARES program, that uh, we, we make sure we target those individuals that haven't received any monies yet. Because I think that's one of the things that we're hearing out there is that some of these larger, um, smaller businesses are out there and they're, they're basically getting all the resources that are out there and the smaller ones are, are losing out of the opportunity. The other thing too is um, when it comes to helping the elderly, elderly with um, supplies for their houses and all that, um, one of the things that we get is a lot of calls about the red tape. If there's a way to cut through some of the red tape and make it more simpler, if an elder person has a water heater that blew out, then we can actually go in there and, and, and fix it and not have them um, go through this long process to see if they qualify or not. These are emergency type of issues from water pipes to air conditionings to um, all kinds of different things. So I just wanna make sure that we we're, we cut the process down and that we make sure that small businesses that haven't received any um, source of funding for the federal government, state level, are from the city, are the first in line. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think that is a great suggestion. Yeah. It appears that the PPP plan did not provide great service for those who we might call underbanked in our community and, and the smallest. So I think that is a great suggestion. We'll go to the vice mayor and then Councilman DeCicio. Great. Thank, thank you, Mayor. 
Um, so I just want to say, just want to thank everyone for the pres for the presentation um, and, and the detailed presentation. I, I thought that was great. Um, but I also want to be able to say that, you know, this is a key moment uh, where we can help help out small businesses and making sure that we, you know, that we give them um, the funds that, that they need in order for them um, to continue working. I can think of a couple of small businesses in my district that I know are struggling right now, and we need to make sure um, that we do whatever we can to keep them thriving. Um, so I just want to voice my support um, for to making sure that we get them the funding that they need and that I'm very supportive for the micro enterprises um, funding that we have and looking forward to seeing how our businesses and our districts will thrive um, with that funding. Um, so thank you so much everyone for everything that everyone's done. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. A uh, very good plan. I really appreciate all the work that everybody put in this. And Mayor, a lot of credit needs to go to you as well for bringing this forward last year. Um, you did a great job on that, made it a priority in the city. Now we have more monies here to be able to uh, take care of more people. Uh, just a couple of quick things. One is a question, then maybe if we can add something into this, I think people would like. Um, the question I've got too is what, is in particular, the, uh, the, uh, the Section 8 vouchers, what happens when those funds dry up? My understanding is that that's a one-year grant. Is that correct or am I wrong? And then what happens to the, uh, what happens with this and maybe other things? So Mayor, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, um, that is a, a, a temporary addition of funding um, to try to make up for the estimated loss of income um, for the voucher holders that we are seeing with COVID. Um, so it is a temporary uh, allocation. We would continue with our normal program next year if we didn't get any additional funding. Um, what would happen is if we have significantly more loss in rental income and have to make up a significantly more of a difference, uh, it would come out of the normal budget and we would just not lease up additional vouchers. So um, hopefully HUD would keep an eye on that and the federal government and maybe give us additional money to keep the current voucher holders um, whole during that time. So what we would do is just supplement it once once these monies. I just want to make sure I know where we're going to be at, you know, because I don't want it to be a surprise either. And thank you for saying that. So just to be clear, um, these additional monies, if, if if they do dry up at the federal government, which what they may, there's always that chance. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot more unemployment than people think, but you know that's 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 another issue. So if the federal government did dry up those funds because it is temporary those individuals in those homes would then have to cover that expense, correct? Or they'd have to go find something. They'd have to move and go somewhere else, correct? Uh, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, um, that is not the case. So um, we, would, we continue to okay. pay existing vouchers rent, and what we would do is just not lease up any new vouchers if we had a budget issue. So we always keep current voucher holders whole. We do not take people off of vouchers because of budget issues. We just we just don't lease up new vouchers. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, it does. And so basically we're always gonna have an open amount is what you're saying, because we have a percentage that are open right now, correct? Yes, yeah, so we always have a turnover of vouchers. You always have people coming off, you always have vouchers yeah. out there and people searching for homes. So what we would do is stop allocating or stop uh, mm -hmm. putting people into new vouchers if we didn't have the budget for it. And we would keep existing voucher holders whole. Okay, so that's, okay. So we would just basically find a way to phase them in and just protect them is what we're doing. Because you don't want, people moving is a big deal. You know, that's not something easy for anyone and I appreciate that. Uh, the other, we've had a policy of taking care of the homeless veterans first. Uh, you know, within the program, I didn't see them in here. Is that an ad we can add on, Cindy? Uh, Councilman DeCicio, this is Deanna. Um, we did say that um, yeah, both Deanna. the single men and the single women side that we would allocate VASH vouchers. Those vouchers are specifically for our veterans. Right now we have 10 allocated to women and 40 allocated to men. I can let um, Cindy speak to if we needed additional vouchers. I believe we do have the capacity to identify more if we identify more veterans. 
We, we should do that because the goal that this council passed, and it hasn't changed yet, was to, you know, the goal was 100% of the veterans to be out of homelessness. And from everything that I've heard is that that skyrocketed at this point. And I just want to make sure that that goal that we passed and, you know, through ordinance is still there, that, that, that we're still focused on 100% uh, veterans not being homeless. I just want to make sure we're still there. Yes, we are With still. This model are st and others. Yes, Councilman DeCicio, we are still prioritizing our veterans, and we do do have bash vouchers available. So we'll continue to work in partnership with the VA to make sure every veteran we identify that is eligible receives the VASH voucher. So if it's more than 40 in the men and 10 in the women, then what do we do? Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, this is Cindy. Um, we uh, have about 200 unleased VASH vouchers at this time. So um, if there are more than 40 during this process, we can use the other unleased vouchers and, and put them towards uh, these homeless veterans. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure we're still on target of making sure that they're not homeless. And then I'd like to get an idea of where we are with the homeless veterans. Um, if you could put together a report, or Ed, if you could ask for a report to be done. Uh, what, we, um, what I'm hearing from the homeless community is that there are a lot more than just 30 or 40 out there. So I'd like to get an idea of how many homeless veterans we have and what our approach is with them and how we, you know, what are we doing with them? Yes, Councilman DeCicio, we can certainly put together a report for you and look at the by name list to identify how many veterans are on that list within the city of Phoenix and get that information to you. Oh, that'd be huge, thank you. And then the other is whoever's gonna make the motion on this, if we could also add something I think would be kind of a cool thing to do is instruct staff to put together a, you know, a, a telephone number that individuals can call in and donate money, uh, for instance, a lot of individuals, not a lot, some people receive that $1,200 check from the federal government and they may, you know, may not need it. So maybe they can pass that along. And there might be other donations that people would like to give. But if we could create a phone number and use that in some of our promotional activity, I think that would be great. Uh, because I think there are a lot of people out there right now realizing that there are a lot of other individuals that are suffering in our economy and they want to find a way to help. And I think this would be a great way to do that. They can use their $1,200 check or they can find other money. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman DeCicio, this, um, we, we can work on that for sure. We did something like that back in the 2009, 2010 downturn. There also may be alternatives for us to partner with someone like Arizona Community Foundation or others who have those direct links, but we'll, we'll come up with some alternatives, Councilman, for the, for the, for the full council to review um, uh, for that sort of generosity from the community. Yeah, like an internet Mayor? portal or something like that, Ed. Oh. And Councilman Stark has done some very important work, as have other council members, on healthy giving. So. Yeah. Perhaps there is an existing campaign. Councilman Stark. Yeah, and you. I think that's a great suggestion, um, Councilman DeSusio. I also think when uh, Councilman Nowakowski was talking about small businesses, I think we should incorporate into our motion the inclusion of trying to emphasize small businesses. Did I capture that right, Councilman? I would uh, second that if that's a motion. Oh, I'm, I, I'd be happy to make a motion. <laughs> I don't know if the mayor is ready for a motion yet. I think we are ready for a motion. So, okay, I'm going to move um, the staff uh, recommendation with the addition to look at, uh, at securing a telephone line and a connection to uh, receive donations to help us and to emphasize um, small business. I'll second that, Mayor. Wonderful. Thank you, Councilwoman. And councilman, and um, I guess I might ask if you would consider with the one million dollars to support LMI residents shelter in place, if if um, a property were to be available, such as Councilmember Garcia suggested, uh, that could immediately house folks, but then also be available 
in a longer term that that be an eligible use and that if that property were not available, then the existing LMI shelter in place would, would also be a, continue to be a. Absolutely, I think that's critical, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful, yeah, thank you. Just really um, quick Council, Council the CCO's question actually uh, sort of inspired me. For Deanna, um, if, if council members wanted to do more to support our veterans, I have heard that one area where the federal government might benefit is additional staffing at VA to help the folks who work with us on bash vouchers and process that. So if we wanted to do more to get veterans into housing, could we suggest the federal government work with us to, to have more staffing to process those more quickly? Yes, we certainly could take a look at that. Um, one of the areas, we have worked closely with the VA. Um, one of the things we've seen is there are veterans that are eligible on the process going through the VA to get them what I call document ready and ready to go into a VASH voucher. We could certainly use some additional resources there. Wonderful, so council members who have res uh, relationships with members of the federal delegation, that might be an area where we could partner with them and as Councilmember DeCicio suggested, all of us do, do more. Uh, Councilmember DeCicio, floor is yours. I'm sorry, did Councilmember DeCicio have an additional comment? Okay, oh, not hear, hearing sorry, one, I will go to Councilmember Pest <laughs> uh, Perfect, then we will go Councilmember DeCicio and then Councilwoman Pest the, um, Thank you, Mayor. If we can instruct staff to, to, to create an internet portal, it's a lot easier for us to be able to pass it on. I've got a pretty huge list and I've got a strong following on Facebook. I can always put that stuff out um, and I would do it. So if we do something like that, I think that might be a good move and then we can all distribute information out ourselves and then get it out every other way through the city of Phoenix there. And I'm done, thank you, Mayor. Perfect, thank you. There's certainly the need for those additional resources. Councilwoman Pestor. Mayor, Mayor um, I would like to thank the team for all their efforts and what they've been doing. Uh, in the whole process, what I would like to know is once this is voted on, how will this quickly uh, move into the community and how do we get the providers situated and moving so that we can get people in shelter in place? That's one question. Did you want me to respond to that? I can do that first. Uh, and thank you for reminding me, Councilwoman Pastor. I should say, while UMOM is our largest family provider, she does coordinate with Salvation Army and Vista Clean and others that provide family services as well. So for the emergency shelter grant funding, we do have a letter from HUD that says we do not have to go through our normal regular procurement processes. So I am already working with our finance department and the team to figure out how we get the contracts amend amended as quickly as possible to get the funding out to our, our providers. On the CDBG side, we're still awaiting some more clarification and regulations on waiving of the procurement requirements. But to your specific question, my intent is in working with the team, we'd be coming back, hopefully, I'm looking at Marshall, at our next council meeting on May 6th, I believe, to bring contract amendments for both of our two largest providers on the in interventions we spoke about today while working through the CDBG piece on the temporary location and how we acquire that and secure a uh, provider for that intervention. Okay, and then my uh, second question is, is De Colores one of our providers? Did they hear me? Good afternoon, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Okay. Yes, CPLC De Colores is one of our domestic violence shelter providers currently. Okay, I just wanted to know that. And then on a, the affordable housing side, uh, because that is a great need, obviously, right now. How are we going to quickly move that and simultaneously with the dollars that we have? I know there's a, a master plan. Mayor, 
Mayor and Councilwoman Castor, um, we are coming forward, we are planning coming forward uh, very quickly with the affordable housing initiative that we have been working on. We are currently getting uh, additional feedback from the community and we'll be presenting that to council um, probably next month. Um, in the meantime, I am working closely with Spencer, Self, and Marshall, and also um, Chris Mackey in looking for affordable housing properties as we were um, talking about earlier with spending some of the CDBG money. Um, housing has some funding and we're looking at pooling our funding to uh, see if we can purchase um, an, affordable, an apartment complex or something like that to create additional permanent supportive housing to house the homeless immediately. So we will be coming forward with um, results of that search as well. Okay, so, so the housing what will be spent on the affordability, it will be specifically for the homeless? That was the intent was um, if we're the, the searching for um, housing with the current money from the CARES Act that we were just discussing and the money that we're looking at for permanent supportive housing for the homeless. That is the second tier, as Deanna was so talking about. We're looking for permanent solutions for the homeless instead of just temporary solutions such as hotel stays and things like that. We want to move them out of that temporary housing and into permanent supportive housing as quickly as possible, as much as we can. Okay, and then uh, I'm hoping to piggyback on that is that then we're, we're, we're also looking at uh, more affordability housing since the New Times uh, uh, wrote that article about affordability and what is happening. Yes, so Councilwoman Pastor, the Affordable Housing Initiative will talk about the, uh, the need for affordable housing, the number of units that we need in the city of Phoenix, and some ideas and feedback from the community about how to um, create and incent more affordable housing. Okay, thank you ladies for all the work you've done. And Spencer. <laughs> well said. Uh, we are joined by an incredible wealth of expertise on the phone with um, these issues. And so we have folks who, who have been living the day-to-day -day of the problems we are trying to address today. Uh, we will begin by hearing from Lisa Glow followed by Marty Schultz. Uh, Good we'll afternoon, can you hear me now? We can, thank you, and thank you all for your patience. Thank you, good afternoon, mayor and council members. Thank you first for your leadership and support for our homeless neighbors during this pandemic. We also wanna thank and commend the city staff on their incredibly fast and creative work. We've worked closely with them through the years and especially during the pandemic to get more people into housing. Um, with the city staff, we've been able to start moving more of our homeless seniors into housing and the momentum is there for more to come. CAS's mission has been fortified during this crisis and partnerships have been strengthened with a unified commitment to work together to the following two ends. First, to prevent the spread of COVID by ensuring the health and safety of our employees, our clients, and our community. We're following CDC guidelines, have been rigorous in all we're doing at both our family and adult shelter, but even more importantly, we're united with other homeless providers, the Human Services Campus, Circle the City, CBI, UMOM, and all in our community approach, which is really critical. And I am confident we'll carry that momentum forward into building a stronger infrastructure in future. Secondly, we wanna be able to say at the end of this pandemic that we have made a significant and lasting impact to end homelessness for hundreds of people. To that, we're shoring up our housing programs, our case management teams, and our partnerships to get more people to permanency as quickly as we can, which is definitely in alignment with the plan the city is putting together. However, the demand for more emergency shelter beds right now has never been greater, and given COVID, we have to move quickly. We had to make uh, some adjustments in our adult shelter to ensure social distancing. So we're at about 370, but we cannot go any more than 390. So we are um, commend you, we're supportive and commend you in the plans to make more space av available, a hotel now for our most vulnerable. And we're prepared and ready to help shelter them and also get more women into permanency as they stay in that temporary location. As you know, elderly persons who are homeless will continue. Oh, I heard some beeping there. Elderly persons who are homeless have been a high priority for me and for CAS. Um, to that end, we were awarded a large paper grant uh, last year for three years. We have created a, a specially trained team to work with seniors to screen them, address their medical needs, their dementia needs. 
we've created a new screening tool for our homeless seniors to help build a model program, and we're creating partnerships to fill the gaps in services for seniors. It's a system that's been far too disconnected, as I think Councilman Nowakowski was saying. There's a lot of red tape and disconnected it, disconnectedness that sometimes leads to homelessness for our seniors. And it, 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 and Lisa, it, it, sorry. Um, uh, would one of your board members who's on be able to donate additional time so you could finish your comments? Oh, would you donate some time, Carl or Nico? I need just about one more minute. Um, I think they would. Um, I, I do want to say we uh, we serve uh, as I was listening to the council persons. We serve a broad array of folks. We serve people with domestic violence who are homeless because of that. We serve youth. We serve the undocumented, and it's really critical that we also triage and pull out the most vulnerable folks from our mass shelter at this time to get them to safety. That's why we're so supportive of the plan. We also serve vulnerable um, veterans. Last year, 450 of them and 255 were elderly. So I um, do want to close and say thank you and reiterate that we see this time as a chance to do even more for our homeless neighbors and in partnership with a unified mission out of the crisis, we believe together we'll build stronger systems and the infrastructure needed to get more people off the streets into permanent housing. So we are in support of the city's plan and thank you. And now over to Carl Oberg. Or thank you, Mayor. It's up to you to next. <laughs> I had previously said we would next turn to, to Marty Schultz. So I will go ahead and do that. And then uh, Marty can be followed by Carl Oberg. Thank you. I'll tell you what I will do. I will. Um donate most of my time to all the other people who uh, have something to say. In uh, past years, the private sector um, was very involved, as you know. But under this circumstance, when you brought um, the program's uh, elements together, and then the situation changed because of uh, health and because of the virus, uh, that was a huge challenge to this community. And the way this uh, team, I'm talking about the uh, government team and the private sector team has come together and saying and uh, fashioned these programs uh, under your leadership and under the leadership of this council and staff has been amazing. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. I know the community appreciates it. They may not understand all the details, but um, there's a lot of support out here, including some funding support, uh, which uh, we can talk about later. But I want to thank you for everything that you've done to date. Uh, this is exceedingly difficult, um, and so far the accomplishments have been tremendous. Thank you, thank you for your longtime leadership. Uh, we will next go to Carl, followed by Darlene Newsom. Well, um, I'm privileged to even follow Marty Schultz, by the way. So um, mayor, council members, thank you for this opportunity to speak and everything you've done to protect the citizens of Phoenix. On behalf of CAST, we hope that you and your families are healthy and safe. I am Carl Oberg. I am the current board chair for CAS, and none of us claim to have, this, have the experience associated with this virus, COVID-19, and its effects on the elderly. And we're learning quickly, though. Um, we do claim that we have firsthand knowledge on homelessness and mental health. Our board and staff also claim to have huge hearts, especially associated with homeless children, veterans, and seniors throughout Arizona. But our CAS board really commends our CEO and staff for the way they've moved swiftly to separate the high-risk seniors and people with chronic health issues from the rest of the clients served. You know, most of these folks were forced on the streets due to increased rents, loss of a spouse or partner, and the income that was associated with that, and, and also not having any friends or family to assist and support. So everything you guys are doing is amazing. Every one of the seniors and people with chronic illness issues that are vulnerable at CAS did not plan for this way of life or this virus. And getting them to a stable place that is safe and secure may be the only thing left to minimize the stress they have endured or are enduring. We have identified a hotel opportunity uh, for, them, for these individuals to sleep in a comfortable bed for the time being. Then CAS can actually get back to focusing on our future West Valley facility for seniors. Uh, our CEO and staff are going above and beyond to do their part in mitigating the spread and to flatten the curve of COVID-19. We need to reinstitute dignity back into these folks' lives. And this council can be that bright light within their dark, within these dark times for them. And you know, other cities will follow, but I really appreciate your time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, Darlene will be followed by DD Yazi Divine. Okay. okay. Thank you, Darlene. The floor is yours. And have really helped pull together many of the providers. I hear a sound. Am I okay? Possible that you have two sound sources, one you're speaking into your phone and one you're listening to it online? I, uh, no, I just have my, um, my regular speaker here. Can you hear me now? There is an echo, so sometimes when people mute a laptop, it helps, but we'll just have to power through. Oh, okay. I'm, I'll be quick then. Um, I just want to say that in family homelessness, the first week of the COVID-19, we had a 30% increase in families who were on our wait list. And so our wait list got up to 170 families. And we know 103 of those families were actually living on the street. Um, in response to that, UMOM opened up a 25 additional units on its main campus. And uh, we just repurposed rooms and found rooms because we felt like 170 families on the list and children on the streets was unacceptable. Um, I do want to mention that rapidly housing is one of our most effective ways of meeting homelessness. And with these additional rapidly housing units for not only families but single women, will have a great impact in um, ending homelessness for hundreds of individuals and families. I do want to mention that you, Mom, we're working with the CDC and all the health organizations. We have space to quarantine any families or single women or youth that contract the virus. I do want to share today that we have no positive COVID-19 on any of our five campuses that we operate. Um, and we have, oh, we are continuing to do intake on all our sites. Uh, I do want to address affordable housing quickly. We are opening up 90 Are units. you on a speakerphone by chance? Would it be possible, are you possible to switch to a handheld unit from a speaker? I have a handheld unit here, but I'm on a desktop. Okay, we're just trying to address what, okay. Can you hear me at all? There's just a lot of feedback, so we were guessing if it was a... Okay. What was the sound? Yeah. I just I just have one more thing to say is that we're opening up 90 units in District 8, Councilman Garcia's area for 55 and over. Those 90 units in affordable housing should be open uh, the first week in May with a preference for veterans. And with that, I'll end. I'm sorry about the interference. Well, thank you for powering through and for the important work you're doing. It's exciting. Uh, to have that unit opening at, at such a key time. Um, so thank you. Uh, we will next go uh, to Dee Dee, followed, followed by Amy Schwabenlender. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can, thank you. A little bit of, of static in the back. Hmm. I'm gonna see if I can take it off speaker. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I, I would like to begin and thank you, Mayor, for your leadership and um, always focusing on our homeless population. I want to really thank you for that and appreciate that. And all the council members who have um, uh, worked on this issue and the staff members who have taken such quick actions and really put this plan together. I, uh, the staff have been... Mayor, I think it's the... The council chamber's mic that's on. So we could have staff turn it off or mute it. That is a great suggestion. Oh, that's beautiful. We don't have any better mics. anyway. Hello? So that I think someone muted the key microphone, so Okay. We'll have to so, give Darlene uh a better credit, but you you come through beautifully now. Okay, thank you. So I just so I began by just by thanking everyone and their quick actions and their focus on our uh, homeless population. I wanted to just say that um, uh, all of Native American Connections, a thousand units of housing, 
our youth shelter and including our residential substance abuse treatment programs have remained open and full during this period of time. And I really appreciate the focus on homeless youth and LGBTQ youth and uh, uh, Council Member Garcia bringing up uh, vulnerable populations, as many of the members did. I don't want to forget that um, there are uh, uh, the presence of um, medical complications in the black and brown community and particularly in our Native American community here in Arizona. Um, we do have positive cases in quarantine in our housing communities. Unfortunately, all positive cases are Native people. Um, and we have uh, some people also that are um, symptomatic in quarantine as well. Um, and providing the support, uh, uh, knowing that our council and our city is so supportive allows us to continue to do that work every day. I really appreciate your support for home base and the, and, and the youth shelter um, and keeping our youth uh, safe during this period of time. Um, I uh, understand the importance and the focus right now with the COVID funding of providing immediate and temporary solutions for homelessness, but we can't take our eye off permanent, uh, permanent housing solutions. As we know, the permanent housing solutions were in crisis before this started, and they'll continue to be. And I think we need to really remember that as we have, um, as Native American Connections and as uh, uh, dictated by HUD to have no evictions during this 120-day period, we also need to really keep our eye on those people that are unable, that have lost their jobs or unable to pay their rent during this time. Um, you know, to make sure that nobody um, becomes homeless when that 120 day ends. And so we have to keep our eye on that as well. Um, we also are focused on the veterans housing. So I appreciate that conversation. We're opening almost 100 units of housing, this pre permanent supportive housing this year, um, one community in August and one in December. And both of them have a focus on um, housing veterans. So we'll be working along with Darlene and and uh, Lisa and several other people and making sure that we, uh, that our homeless population are housed. And um, I just wanna thank uh, again, uh, the staff for your hard work and your support in getting all this information together and presented to the council. And we support uh, this plan as well. Wonderful, thank you for your longtime service for this community and for putting up with our learning about sound. Uh, we will next go to Amy, followed by Barbara Lukowitz. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Are you hearing me okay? You are coming through are beautifully. Coming through and no, through no, 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 perfect. Feedback, no feedback. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank, again, reiterate what everyone said. Thank Mayor and Council for considering the request and the deep work that staff put into how to use this one-time limited funding, as we all know, resources are, are scarce now and before. I appreciate that human services and housing and neighborhood services are working together and looking at what we know are evidence-based best practices and permit supportive housing, rapid rehousing. And of course, here at the Human Services Campus, we're concerned for all the people we can shelter and all the people we are unable to shelter. And we have very committed staff, as Lisa mentioned, um, Cass and our partners are working more closely together. I believe at the end of COVID-19, we will be able to truly demonstrate to the community the original mission of the Human Services Campus, which is to collaborate to end homelessness. And in crisis, we're all forced to work to our strengths and stay in our lane. And we're doing that in such a smooth way. I'm so, um, I make myself cry because I'm so incredibly honored to work with people who have really put everything aside to focus on our clients and how to ensure we're saving lives of people who are most vulnerable to this coronavirus. And I look forward to the systems change that we're learning as we work through this together. Um, and my, my final comment is I hope that more people leave coronavirus with the awareness that housing is healthcare. The first thing we were all told to do was to stay home. And it's impossible to stay home if you don't have one. So as all the conversation alluded to long-term strategies, we absolutely have to keep those in mind. And I believe we're all learning so much 
in this pandemic that will have so much to apply to long-term strategies after this. So thank you again. Thank you. Well thank said you. summary well of said our, our focus today. Uh, we'll next go to someone who has deep expertise in, in serving older adults experiencing homelessness, uh, Barbara Lukowitz, and uh, she will be followed by Elizabeth Venable. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I simply want to commend the city staff and the council for this comprehensive plan. I think that a lot of uh, hard work and a very small amount of time went into this. Um, I, I support that you all pass this quickly and implement it. And I cede the rest of my time to Nico Howard, but thank you very much for all the hard work and for a really comprehensive plan. Wonderful, thank you for, for your commitment. We will go to Elizabeth, followed by Nico Howard. Hello, can you hear me? We. Yes, we okay. can. Okay, I am. I apologize for the extra noise. I am right in the vicinity of Cass, right by these parking lots, where um, the unsheltered population is going to be housed. I am slightly concerned because. Um, you have to have a CAS ID to be able to stay in these parking lots. You aren't going to be able to get access to the bathrooms or the uh, hand washing stations unless you have a CAS ID. Many people do not have a CAS ID. Also, I'm a little bit concerned that the services seem to target popular groups of homeless individuals as opposed to many of the homeless individuals who are deliberately excluded from these programs uh, because of barriers. Barriers may be including uh, lack of compliance with a treatment plan or other things like that which explicitly exclude people. Also, I'm a little bit disappointed not to see any um, funding from the general fund, I expect you to allocate federal funds wisely and it seems like you are doing a fairly good job at allocating those funds that you were given, but I don't see a commitment from the city of Phoenix. And so I would say my main focus is uh, make sure your strategies address low or low barrier and address those populations who are hard to reach, who are harder to serve and who are less popular to serve, because those are the people who are also vulnerable, not just the people who are in the shelters over 60. That's the end of my talk. Wonderful, thank you. Nico will be followed by Craig Tripkin. Wonderful, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members and staff, let me start by saying thank you for having me today. I would also like to thank staff for setting forth what I consider to be a thorough, thoughtful, and effective plan. My name is Nico Howard, and I'm the Vice Chair of Central Arizona Shelter Services. I ask to speak today because I'd like to share a unique perspective on the issue before us. This is not a homelessness issue. This is a health and safety issue. This is an economic issue and this is a human dignity issue. I firmly believe that we as members of this community have a moral obligation to look after our most vulnerable populations. However, even if you do not subscribe to this philosophy, I believe that you will agree with my conclusions. If we do not employ best practices to contain the spread of COVID-19 within our most vulnerable populations, it will not stay within our most vulnerable populations. It will continue to spread across our city, wreaking both physical and economic havoc as it does. The individuals that we are talking about today live on our streets. They stand outside of our favorite restaurants where we take our families and they ride the same buses as our children. As a nation, we have shut down our economy so that we can contain this contagion. However, we are only as strong as our most vulnerable point of infection. If we do not allocate adequate resources to this end, then the quarantine and the economic collapse that it has caused will be for nothing. All of the benefit will be undone. In short, I ask you to support the city's plan to assist these vulnerable populations, and I ask you to allocate funds to CAS so that it can provide the necessary services during this pandemic. I ask this because these people need our help, and we at CAS are in the best position to help them. In offering your support for these populations, you are not just protecting the vulnerable, but you are protecting the economy and the public health. Thank you for your time today and for your service to our community. 
Phoenix is the most livable city in the world because you as our mayor, vice mayor, city council, and staff have made it so. Thank you so much. Craig will be followed by Alicia McKinley. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Mayor, I just, we've, we've got, we've, a lot of people have said a lot of things at all. All I can add is everything's been said, but not by everybody, and I hope that uh, the council passes this. Thank you. Powerful and succinct, succinct. thank you. Uh, Alicia will be followed by Angela O'Dell. Hello, my name is Alicia, and I am sitting here at Ninth Avenue, where the lots are going to be filled in the morning at about nine o'clock. Um, and my concern is that the elderly people are being placed there. Um, I don't think that that's a good idea uh, because we are experiencing, like uh, right now, experiencing being here with the younger people and the elderly people, I don't think that's a good mixture. Also, I don't, I think that the cleanup should be clean up, not just clean. It needs to be cleaned up and sanitized um, because of the virus that's going around the, the, the tents are just like <laughs> too close together. And I'm, that's another concern. Um, are they going to be close? Are they going to be apart six feet or whatever the requirements are? Um, and also, um, um, I, I think that we should be um, looking at like maybe something over that area, like a awning or something, because right now, even when it's like the sun shining now and it's still hot, it's getting hotter. So we need to probably look at like an awning or someplace cooler or um my most concern is housing and probably uh, maybe elderly people dying out here. So we need to probably focus on the housing for elderly people instead of the lot. And that's my um, comment. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Alicia. And I, I believe the, the plan would be as soon as possible to get the our oldest uh, people experiencing homelessness into hotel rooms. So hopefully following your, your good advice. Angela will be followed by Chris Abert. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor, Council, and uh, all the members that are working hard to work on this. I am the chair for the Madison Pioneers Coalition, and we are ground zero for the homeless crisis down here. Um, I guess what we'd like to know, we're glad to see that they're moving in the right direction to get uh, an overflow. We are curious, uh, how is this going to work? How will it be staffed? Um, what kind of security it will have? How will it be regulated? Um, we've got at any given night, probably 300 tents and close to anywhere between four and 500 people on the street. So we're wanting to know how this will be staffed. Uh, how will it be kept clean and, you know, free with the flies and the heat, uh, how long they plan on doing this, and what this means for all the people that are on the easements, um, enforcement-wise, how will they be handling things? Uh, we, we'd just like to see what, what are the parameters. It seems like it came up really quick. We haven't been consulted, and we are in the middle of this. So um, along with the little gal before me, Alicia, the cleanup is very insufficient. It's a concern for all of us. Um, you know, we've got people on top of each other out here. They have no mask. Uh, things that would just be standard uh, bathrooms, washing facilities, they don't have that. And they are on top of each other. So we'd like to know what, what is the game plan? How will this all work? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Chris will be followed by Bill Moreland. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council members for your attention to this population. 
Uh, the Southwest Recovery Alliance and the executive director, we work with people who experience homelessness, uh, who have severe substance use disorder, primarily to prevent infectious diseases like uh, HIV and Hep C. And we have quickly moved to try to make sure people are educated and as safe as they can be with COVID-19. Um, over the last week, we've been trying to prepare and, and actually asking participants what it is that they need. We told them about the money that was available and we said, what do you need? What do you need? And uh, I don't think it'll be surprising that they said they need housing, right? Uh, but particularly, they needed housing that they weren't going to have to pay for and they needed housing that they were going to be able to have with their felony, that they were going to be able to get housing uh, with their severe substance use disorder that they were gonna be able to get housing prior to having severe mental illness addressed. Um, so, so I think without knowing it, what they were asking for was Housing First. And uh, for those that aren't familiar, Housing First is uh, prioritizes permanent and supportive housing uh, for folks, regardless of their engagement in any other services. So it's just basically Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We have to have housing and food before we can begin to even contemplate addressing these other uh, issues. Um, so I think it's also important, and so I, I, I'm happy that Council Member um, Garcia brought up the idea of making sure that whatever money gets put out, maybe there's a possibility uh, for extending that out and not having it just be a stopgap, but perhaps a housing first effort uh, in Phoenix. Um, one of the best things about it is that it, it helps people who don't meet requirements of Section 8 vouchers, of, of even other housing first options uh, in Phoenix, right? Have like felony requirements and all types of things that have very high barriers uh, that aren't necessarily housing first. Um, so, so that was what I was here to advocate for. I was just here to try to give voice to our participants. Uh, our board of directors, 51% of them are also participants. Uh, so we really are nothing about us without us. Uh, we have homeless people on our board. Uh, we make all of our decisions with participants in mind, and we hope that other people do, that they have more than just focus groups, that they're actually asking people who are experiencing these issues, what do you need? How has your life changed since COVID-19? How can we best be of service to you? Uh, and give them real power uh, to make sure that the things that they say are instituted. Uh, and the last Thank thing you. I just want to point out two quick there's two really good models for this, Pathways to Housing in New York City and then Crawford House in Bloomington, Indiana, and much more information on nhomelessness.org. So again, I just wanna thank Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and Council members for their thought on this and for keeping an eye out for these people. It's so hard just to keep up with HIV, Hep C and fatal overdose. So COVID-19 is, yeah, thank right. you for all your work. One more thank challenge. You. Thank you for your work. Bill will be followed by Charlene Tarver. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. I, like a lot of other people, I wanted to thank everyone for all of their hard work on this effort. So I am involved with both CAS and the My Madison Pioneers Coalition. So I'm uh, approaching this from a lot of different directions. So I see a lot of positive things, but um, I understand the need to focus on what we're calling the most vulnerable populations, but the reason we have all of the shelter in place and the stay at home ordinances is because everyone is vulnerable right now with COVID-19. I mean, this impacts everyone, this affects everyone, and this jumps from person to person in, you know, at an incredible rate. So as long as the city either allows or forces people to be sleeping in tents on the easements on top of each other, those people are vulnerable, whether they have underlying health issues, whatever their age is, every one of those people sleeping out there on the streets is made more vulnerable by where they are. And then also being down here, every one of my employees, every one of my customers, my family, we all become vulnerable because of what's going on down here in the street. So I appreciate everything that you're doing, but I need to urge even more to go back to what Deb Stark was asking about what's gonna happen with all of the people on the easement, to go back to what Deb was saying, there needs to be a place for those people to go, and there needs to be a place where they can go with dignity and respect but also there needs to be a place that they 
need to go where they can be taken care of and where everyone else can be taken care of. And I also agree with the woman who said uh, those lots are a, a good idea. you got to have a covering because it's going to be really, really hot for the people who are under there. So, again, thank you, everyone, but this is not an issue um, that can be left to the decision of the people sleeping in the tents. This is a decision that affects everyone. Thank you so much. Um, sh I understand Charlene is no longer with us. Charlene? Uh, then we'll move to Christian Clark. Christian, are you still with us? Sorry, you're muted. Can you hear me all right? We, now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, cool. Taking you off speaker, too. So I haven't really been in this for too long, but what I can say is what would help me help the people that I work with, which are people who use drugs, people with substance abuse disorder, and the unhoused would be having a place to meet them. So like Chris said, housing first would really be beneficial for them and for those of us who help the people on the street. So that's really all I have for today. Wonderful. Thank you, and thank you for and for all of our speakers for their dedication and advocacy, we've certainly had some great expertise join us on the phone today. Um, I will turn back to uh, any council members for additional questions or comments. Hearing none, uh, we will Mayor, move then to a vote. Mayor, I have Councilman a quick question. Uh, council member Garcia. Thank you. Um, I heard a couple of comments regarding barriers or exclusions that we have. Can someone speak to those with either the current partners that we work with or um, or with, with any of the city services? What are those barriers that are there? And if there are any, because of the COVID experience and what's happening right now in the crisis, is there a way to remove some of them? So, Councilman Garcia, this is Deanna. I'll start and possibly turn it over to Marshall and Cindy. So, each of the providers have different requirements in order to enter their current um, services. So, for example, on the family side, there's specific requirements in order to get into the family shelters as well as CAS. I don't believe, and somebody here at the table can correct me if I'm wrong, that we currently have what we're referring to as a low barrier shelter where you can come in um, you can come into the facility without any type of requirements or, or certain um, rules that you have to comply with. That does not exist right now. I don't know if either one of you want to add anything or if I actually answered your question, but we do, what a couple of them were referring to on the Housing First models, there have been models in past years where they refer to them as low demand or housing first, where you can come in, you could potentially be using, you could have mental health issues, and you are able to get into the facilities with multiple type issues. And they refer to those as low barrier uh, facilities. Okay, so just to clarify, all our partners and who would be supporting through this money would have those low barriers? Or they wouldn't. They Mayor all have Ga different ones. Mayor Gallego yes. and Councilman Garcia, this is Marshall. Uh, Deanna was correct in terms of um, our current providers who provide those services. Uh, I would not uh, necessarily describe it as low barriers. They do have their individual requirements um, that are based upon their needs uh, and, and how they deliver their services. But in terms of um, opportunities where if you currently have a substance abuse or misuse, mental health, that type of thing, uh, we currently do not have any providers uh, where those types of um, challenges, if you will, if you're experiencing homelessness, allow those conditions for those individuals to be able to access services. And I should clarify a little bit. I happen to have my phone here, so my phone's blowing up at the same time. Um, our, our largest family facility and our largest single facility are considered low barrier. So speaking specifically about 
whether we would have to get for you as a follow-up because I don't want to speak out of turn or give you misinformation exactly what's required to get into both of those facilities but they are considered low barrier and actually uh, Deanna I am feeling slightly guilty for the sound quality we gave to to Darlene so um, since she also has probably um, something relevant to say on this particular topic um, could we go back to Darlene Newsom? who uh, we had some some feedback mayor just before we go back to her I, I really want to encourage or see if we can add some funding to this particular population that might be left out of other programming councilman garcia if i may create some clarification here because i think i'm creating an issue that doesn't need to be on the um cast side if i understand correctly from lisa glow they can come in having used, um, in a certain area, come in having used substance and are mentally ill. And that is also the same on the family side. So I will ensure that that is accurate and correct. But that is what I'm being told now is that they are considered low barrier and they can come in with those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Could we turn back to Darlene who had the poor sound quality earlier? But also has done a good work on this issue. It's not. Oh, no, we still have. Thank you, Mayor. Hey, okay, it appears the sound quality then might be something not oh. related to the council speakers. That okay. is better. Oh, it is better. Okay. Nope, I spoke too soon. All right, well, maybe we will leave it for a future council meeting to hear from Darlene, but know that I think Deanna did say a little bit to the extent that, that it is, there is, uh, that uh, you mom does offer low barrier options. Uh, I see on my screen that, that Charlene Tarver has come back online or, or perhaps we never lost her. Uh, could we turn to Charlene Tarver for testimony? Charlene, go ahead. I see Charlene has gone off mute, but I am unable to hear her. Charlene, final? Well, we are certainly grateful for your service in, in many different capacities in our community, and I am sorry for technical difficulties. Uh, one of many things more difficult in the COVID-19 era. Uh, Council Member Garcia, uh, do you have any, did you, did we get your comments? Yeah, I think that was good. I, I think the one, I don't, can we clarify where we're at with the motion? Because I heard a motion about us uh, fundraising, but is there a motion to pass what the plan that was put forth? If not, I can make a motion to pass the yeah. plan that was put forth by it, staff. It, there was a motion made, seconded by uh, Councilman Nowakowski, that included their plan, the staff plan, as well as a focus on the small businesses and with um, the fundraising. And your and your request. Okay. Am I so we have a, yeah. a motion and a second on the table. Any comments or questions? Or are we ready to vote? So. All right. Well, then uh, we will go to roll call. Yes. Councilman DeCicio. Yes. Councilmember Garcia. Yes. Councilman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilwoman Pastor? Yes. Councilwoman Stark? Yes. Councilman Waring? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Vice Mayor Guardado? Yes. Mayor Gallego?
Yes. Mayor, that passes unanimously. Motion passes unanimously and represents the largest commitment the Phoenix City Council has made using community development block grants towards fighting homelessness. So thank you. I think an important step forward to our community. Uh, one of the most cruel parts of, of COVID-19 is that those who were vulnerable before have even greater challenges and today's council meeting represents important steps forward with unanimous support for our Phoenix City Council to combat homelessness, to support our small businesses, to support our nonprofits. So we hope we are saying a small bit of thank you for the heroic work that people fighting homelessness, our nonprofits and our small businesses are doing in this era. Thank you for what you have done through social distancing to reduce the spread of COVID-19. We know it is not enough, but we think it is a, a important step forward and that we can continue to, to work in this area. The city council, as you heard, will continue to talk about fighting homelessness and affordable housing. We know the challenges we faced before continue, but I am proud of our steps forward and grateful to all who contributed to this plan. Uh, with that, uh, we did receive three comment cards, uh, not wishing to speak for this council meeting, um, not on topics related to homelessness and would encourage anyone who has comments. Our, we have a formal meeting coming up and you um, are welcome to submit general comments at that or if you have a, an agendized topic, you can join the great experts who, had, who have spoken today. Um, thank you again to all of our partners and our city staff for putting together this important plant. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>